Hello everyone, you're listening to The Right Side of Gaming. Today we're going to be talking about Anime 5e. It's a supplement made by the people who produce Big Eyes, Small Mouth, or B-E-S-M. And yes, that's an E. It's the fifth letter of the alphabet, I swear. It's not a dirty acronym. I know it might sound similar, but B-E-S-M. And it's for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. The idea is they want you to be able to play something a little more anime-inspired in your 5e campaigns, and they use a lot of their existing mechanics and try to sort of combine the two systems a little bit. To start with, they're wanting to do something a little more effect-based. So normally in 5e, it's powers-based. You have a feat that lets you do a thing. You have a spell that lets you do a thing. Or a racial ability, or whatever. And you know that whenever you do something, it comes from that specific ability. Well, think of this the other way around. So they give the example of, you have flight. Okay, you can fly. It doesn't tell you anything about how or why. You get to decide, you know, are you flying because you have wings? Are you flying because you have magic? Is it a psychic thing? Do you have sort of a a magneto thing going? You can tie it to an item or a power if you want. But the important thing is you can fly. So you're sort of taking the effect you want and working back and customizing it from there. If you're not familiar with BESM, it's pretty much the same approach that they do in there. You have a bunch of abilities and modifiers and stuff, and you get to combine them how you want to get the effects you want. It offers a whole lot of, I guess, creativity and options, in my opinion, because I've never had any issue finding a way to make whatever fantasy power I wanted in BESM. It should also be noted that, like BESM, this is a point-based system. In D&D, you would just go, okay, well, here's my starting abilities, and I just buy them based off this point-by system, or we randomly generate them. Then I just automatically get whatever my race gives me, and my class gives me. There might be feats in there, but everything is sort of separated out that way. In BESM and in Anime 5e, it's point-based, so you're allotting the various points to buy, you know, your various abilities, your racial stuff. Um, Your class is going to have points, although you don't have to actually pay for them. We'll get into that. But everything is balanced off of a point system because you get to use your points for basically anything and everything. That also means that balance is going to be based on the cost of things and rather than trying to balance one race with another, or one class with another. Now, Anime 5e doesn't go over all the details, like the lore, or the personality traits, and stuff like that, of the player handbook races. But it does give you the points of them. They did go through and sort of calculate how much they would cost in the Anime 5e system. And then they did the same with the classes, as well as with magic. In 5e, it uses a Vancian magic system, where you have, you know, X spells that you can cast of Y level per day. So it's like, oh, you start off, you can cast two first level spells per day. Well, 5e, it's based on powers you buy, and you have, like, this energy pool and all this other stuff that you use to cast spells rather than this specific Vancian chart. Now, Anime 5e went with the traditional D&D stats. You have strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, everything that you would expect from D&D. BESM, on the other hand, uses a tri-stat system, last I looked at it, where you had body, mind, and spirit. 
But since they're going to be using a lot of the, I guess not the character related stuff, but a lot of the, the nitty gritty, you know, combat and skills and that type of stuff comes more from 5e. So they're using the, you know, 5e and the D&D &D stats. And for the most part, they tend to do about what you're used to in 5e. There is some new stuff in there, but for the most part, you know, if your dexterity is going to affect your range damage and your initiative, your constitution is going to grant you more health, all that normal stuff. Now, BESM used sort of a, a tiered system based on points. You know, if you had up to a certain number of points, you were a human. Another range of points might call you superhuman. Another might put you at, like, superhero level. And they had different names for them. The same concept applies in here. It's just that they're doing it by level rather than points. So you're a novice at first level. And, you know, you're someone that's never really adventured before. And then you become capable. You've got some experience, but you're still rough around the edges. 5 to 10, you're seasoned. You get some of those mid-level abilities and powers. And then it goes on from there. You have veteran, you have mythical, and then they even have an actual epic category. So that's kind of built in that you can go over 20th level, which is usually, you know, requires special rules or something uh, in most D&D &D editions. Because it's like, okay, well, this is level cap, and you want to go beyond it. So in addition to what you get for just starting a character and picking a class. Uh, you also get a number of discretionary points, and this is going to be where you're going to buy your ability scores, your race, and just some of the you know specific stuff that you want to pick out to really customize your character. And in this case, you start off with 80 points, and then for every level over first, you get an additional point. So if you started at second level, you would get 81 points. If you start at third level, you would get 82 points, and so on. And those extra points are just supposed to, I guess, go towards, you know, this is some of the extra abilities or items or whatever that you might have picked up from your adventures. Now they have benchmarks for character creation so that you... I'm not going to say can't, but makes it a lot harder to make something that just breaks the game like right off the bat. You know, it's really hard to balance encounters if you have a character that's, say, immune to weapon damage, you know, in a fight with a bunch of normally armored characters, because, well, anything that could, you know, hurt one would probably kill the others outright. That said, this is supposed to emulate anime. Sometimes you want that just anime broken feel. So, you know, you could work with your DM if that's the type of game everyone wants to play to, you know, change or ignore the various benchmarks. But they have benchmarks for your two highest ability scores, for your attribute ranks, for your proficiency bonus, for your armor class, or your damage, like just your normal weapon, you know, non-magical damage and things like that. And one of the things that really goes along with making sure that your character isn't too overpowered at, like, first level, right off the bat, is the need for your character to have strengths and weaknesses. In fact, that's probably a recurring theme that we're going to revisit a couple times in here. One of the things they included that I really like is they have this character quiz with a bunch of questions you can answer to just sort of help flesh out your character and figure out, you know, not just role play, but like what, what are they bad at? What are their weaknesses? Things like that. I think my favorite thing like this, I think it was, uh, was it Xanathar's, Xanathar's Guide to Everything. One of them had a bunch of charts you could roll on to sort of help uh, find stuff to flesh out your character. And I think you can find similar stuff all over the internet, but I like the idea of having some of those resources built into 
the books to just sort of help you flesh things out. Now, once you know what your character is going to be good at and bad at and all that other stuff, one of the things you need to do is buy your ability scores. And it's a lot simpler than I expected. The point score is going to be the same as the ability score. So if you, you know, have a 10 in ability, you're using up 10 of your 80 points. If you have a 12 in an ability, you have to pay 12 of your starting 80 points. And to be fair, there's different ways to come up with your scores. It's just that, you know, then you have to pay for them. Now, I think a standard array in 5th edition is an 8, a 10, a 12, a 13, a 14, and a 15, which would be 72 of your 80 starting points. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait, 72 out of 80 points? That only leaves me 8. I, I can't buy most races for that many points. Well, that's okay. We'll get to it a little later on, but you're going to be able to get some points back so you should be able to you know buy the race you want and if all else fails you can always decrease your ability scores a little bit i know that like irks a lot of people because they really want to play you know at least sort of that minimum baseline that we've kind of set but you do have a little bit more freedom over your ability scores i feel like in anime 5e now, the point cost of all the races here you know, includes all of their abilities and their ability score modifiers, all the stuff that you would normally associate with a race. It also adds a few other things, like there's a size modifier. You can gain or lose points, basically, if you're small or large. Like, if you're large, you have to pay an extra five points. If you're small, it's five points cheaper. But you don't have to use one of their templates. You can make a character that is raceless. It will still be of whatever race. It's just that you are sort of using your own points how you want. You're not using their template. You're just spending the points how you see fit. And I think that's really in line with sort of the design philosophy there. Sort of they've been leaning to in 5e. You know, now... They have rules for swapping out your various racial traits. You're not locked into specific ability increases. So if, you know, I want to play a dwarf, but I don't want to increase my constitution or something, that's, that's fine, that's allowed now. You have a lot more freedom to sort of not only customize those races, but we also have rules for creating custom races in 5e. So I, I feel like this isn't necessarily going to be game breaking in and of itself because we now have that create a race in 5e now some of the anime 5e specific races include the archfiend which is about what you would expect the azurai which are like these sort of humans with feathery wings blink beasts which are you know, I guess these bestial creatures that teleport, because that's just what we've associated with the blinking in D&D. The demon naga, which are snake demons. I don't know why we needed two different types of demons, especially... I don't know. But you have that option. You have fairies, which I think most people understand by now. Freys, because clearly you need sci-fi aliens in your anime fantasy RPG. Half dragons, because, well, those are just everywhere. Half trolls, which are not as troll like as I would have expected based on their pictures, but, you know, I guess you can flavor it however you like. You also have Hod, Hod, I don't know how you're going to pronounce that, but you have snake people. Let's just make it easy. You have Kodama, which are these absolutely adorable nature spirits, and I love them to death. I don't know if I actually want to play one, but I would cuddle the heck out of one of those little guys. You have Nikogen, because I don't know if there's an anime fantasy RPG without 
cat girls at this point. I don't know. It just seems like one of those industry staples. You have parasites, which are as creepy as they sound. Satyrs. And one of my personal favorites, slimes. Because uh, we all know exactly what anime I'm thinking of right now. That's got, you know, your slime isekai. Um, but they're definitely, you know, big in JRPGs. And I think that's a very distinctive feel. But again, it gives you the point costs and the attributes for all of those races. But again, if you don't like them, you can combine attributes to make your own race if you really wanted to, just like you can in BESM. And to some extent in D&D now too. They have a chart for how common each race class combination is. Though to be fair, I, I feel like that's a little bit of an outdated concept, especially now that we're at the point where, you know, in D&D &D you can swap out your ability scores. I guess this works if you're still using that. You know, they have to have this specific ability score type of deal, which I guess they do um, if you go back and look at the race. But, but you can really get around that in here by decreasing the attribute you don't want by one point and increasing the attribute you do want by one point. I guess this is just saying that I guess it's more culturally because, you know, as a race in general, they tend to have these sort of strengths and weaknesses, they tend to lean more towards these specific classes. So I guess maybe this is less about character, race, class combinations, and how common those are, more along the lines of how common those are for NPC characters. Like that, I feel, um, is, would be more in line with sort of the, the modern interpretation. I think the important thing is I don't want anyone to feel like this particular chart is going to limit you in any way. I think it's more for flavor. I mean, you can play any combination you want. Now, when it comes to classes, each class is going to get a plus two proficiency bonus at first level, just like in fifth edition, along with their starting hit points and hit die and their, you know, class granted proficiencies again just like fifth edition you don't have to pay for the class either so you can sort of think of it as free points and they have an entire section on how to multi-class what happens if you get duplicate benefits from something like maybe your race and your class give you the same thing and all that and, and sort of what is involved with sort of reallocating points now you can sort of see the, the classes themselves and since the first one is Adventurer, that works out really well because I want you to think of all these classes. Remember, this is BSM. There's a point cost for everything. They're going to give you specific things, but there can be a point cost associated with all of them, even the stuff you get at first level. And essentially, every class except the Adventurer gives you 200 points worth of stuff if you get all the way up to level 20. Adventurer is really interesting in that if you get all the way to level 20, it only gives you 190 points. Adventurer is like, okay, you can spend it on whatever you want. So the Adventurer is supposed to be you know, a, a really flexible class, and honestly, I think probably the one I, I think a lot of players would really have a lot of fun with because it just lets you go crazy and play whatever you want. You also have the Bender, which if you've seen the avatar cartoon again the cartoon not like the cgi movie but like the the nickelodeon cartoon you're on you're very familiar with this you know it's going to be you know using a specific element to do things you have the broker which is all about you know social connections and finding things and is buying and selling and i think that one's pretty straightforward you have the dynamic spellbinder, which is, you know, sort of a magical character, but it focuses more on their specific version of magic rather than the Vancean spell casting type of stuff. You have the hunter, which I'm taking more as bounty hunter and less as the ranger ripoff. 
you have the isekai student because it really wouldn't be an anime fantasy RPG if you didn't have the option to be an isekai. And you actually have, you know, sort of that, oh, I'm in a new world and I've got the, you know, special ability type of deal worked right into the class. You have the magical girl archetype, which in this case is magical girl or magical guy. So if you're familiar with Sailor Moon, this is exactly that type of thing. Or if you're also, if you're familiar with Sailor Moon, Tuxedo Mask, because that would be a magical guy, and he was freaking awesome. Because who doesn't want to dress up in sharp, snazzy clothes and, you know, be super mysterious and throw roses everywhere, but like in a really cool, dangerous way and not like, you know, a wedding flower girl or something. Like, you can make it work, for sure. You have the ninja option, which I feel is pretty self-explanatory at this point. I don't think I have to explain that one in or outside of an anime context. You've got the pet monster trainer for, you know, Pokemon, Digimon, all the, the various ripoffs. Um, <laughs> it's exactly what it sounds like. And they even have, well, they call them in here Neomorphs but you could probably call them whatever you want in your particular setting. You have the psionicist, which is going to be like your psychic powers, essentially. I feel like samurai is another one of those that I shouldn't have to explain. It's exactly what you think it is. There's the shadow warrior, which, you know, has its ties to... You know, the darkness and shadows, because everything needs to have one of those really edgy options in anime. There's the Tech Knight, if you want a little bit more of a high-tech bent to your character. And then there's the Warder, which is sort of this mystical character, and they flavor it with tattoos and stuff like that. As far as, you know, where they get their power from and how they use it. They also did a point breakdown of your more traditional 5e classes and you know how much everything that you get from those classes costs and trying to balance it all. But the end result winds up being about the same and they have these you know anime 5e versions that should be balanced with the rest of the stuff in the book. Now when it talks about attributes in here, we're not talking about your ability scores we're talking about you know sort of the characteristics of your character and your powers and things like that and they have you know a list with all the points and stuff just like they do in the BSM version of the game and the idea is you can really pick and choose and really customize things again these are things that can be applied to your character to your weapons, to your armor, to items, all sorts of stuff. And some of these I recognize from BESM, so some of them did get sort of ported over. You can also customize your abilities by adding enhancements, which are you know, positive effects, like you know, having it affect an area or something like that, or limiters, which are the opposite. These are sort of your your negative, your limitations on using an ability or an effect. Now you can also get more points by assigning defects. So your character might have a couple of these defects to represent you know, character flaws and things like that. I always love these in BSM. And, you know, similar point-by games. Because one, well, it gives me more points to spend. And who doesn't enjoy that? And two, I like the idea of characters that have flaws. And this gives you more incentive to play a flawed character. You want your characters to be strong and effective, for sure. But you don't want them to just be, you know, good at everything and perfect all the time. That doesn't necessarily make for really fun or interesting storytelling, at least in my opinion. I mean, you can make it work, you can enjoy it, but I think there's something to be said for having flaws and conflict, especially, you know, personal stuff or between your character 
and the rest of the party or the character and the NPCs. As long as it's not, you know, something that causes a problem for other people. But having you know, those those flaws just sort of baked into the game, into the character, I think really adds, you know, an extra interesting layer to everything. It adds a little more drama. And a lot of these are relatively open-ended, so it allows the, the DM to either work the player or decide for themselves or what exactly the effects and drawbacks are. And again, a lot of these come you know, from BESM. Now, one of the things that they talk about throughout the book is the need to check in with your group on sensitive topics. There's a great section on establishing boundaries in the session zero portion. They also have you know, a more inclusive section on social sensitivity than most. And I want to focus more on how it was implemented rather than if it should be there or not. I know a lot of people feel really strongly both ways. Some people think, you know, you don't need it, or the people are playing it should decide for themselves, or they're all adults, yada, yada, yada. Others are like, no, this is something that people need to be paying attention to. It has to be in the book. It has to be something you address, and so on and so on. But I, again, want to focus more on how it was done rather than whether it should be in there or not because I think, you know, if they choose to put it in there, that's up to them. But you still need to do it in a manner that I think is sensitive to people across the spectrum on this issue and how they feel about it. I think they did a really good job. A lot of games that I see that you know, typically make a point to put in not only these social issues but really focus on them tend to really lean hard one way politically and I think they handled it a lot better you know they even mention sort of the political spectrum on it so it acknowledges that you're going to have players you know on the left on the right in the center wherever it mentions a lot of things like race and inequality but it doesn't use you know some of the polarizing language that we see you know in media today I think they sort of addressed it from a very neutral perspective. Like, this, I think they took the approach that this is good and this should be in here, but we don't really want to push, you know, any one particular agenda related to any of these. We just want people to know that these are issues that might come up in their game and it might be something that they need to address, but we don't want to tell them how to address it or what to believe or what stance to take. You know, it talks about all these things, you know, gender, sexuality, race, orientation, mental health, addiction, poverty, class, all this stuff without really saying, you know, this is the right opinion or this is how it works in our games. I know it may seem like kind of a, a small issue, not the ones I listed, but how they address it, I, you know. But I really like some games or games I otherwise would have really liked that didn't address these in quite a, an appropriate way. So I really love that they're, you know, putting it in there and not pushing any specific ideologies or stances. Now, this stuff was important to them, even if it may or may not be important to their readers. And they're trying to, I guess, encourage an open discussion rather than dictating this is what you have to do, or assuming this is what type of players we have. Okay, so why did I take that little detour? Well, when we're talking about the defects that you can take for your character, some of them fall into what they call the category of potentially offensive. They even have a thing in there about defects and social awareness, which you can see, because the defects can include things like missing limbs, impaired speech, impaired hearing, physical impairments, being bigoted, or having some form of ism. In fact, that's what they call it in there, ism, because it covers things like it could be racism or sexism or whatever. It has phobias that addresses and things that could just, in general, make people feel uncomfortable if you don't handle it well, especially with you know, specific people at the table. Now, I've read stories where characters have, say, taken vows of silence, for example. 
and it was really well executed or they were mute or they were deaf and the players were mature and they handled it really well. But that doesn't mean that all players or all groups are necessarily going to handle it that well. And this is just kind of like they're you know, giving the players a little bit of a heads up. As for the nitty gritty, you know, the combat rules, the skill check rules, all that stuff. A lot of it is the same or really similar. Not all of it, but a lot of it. There's definitely some changes here and there, but most of it should be fairly second nature to 5e players, and you could probably get away with using a lot of the 5e rules or sort of picking and choosing between the two. And they have some variant rules on some of the stuff, like how to handle extra actions that you can, again, pick and choose from. For example, they have more actions that you can take in, in combat. You have these tactical actions that you can choose from. You have these extra combat maneuvers like various versions of called shots. And they even have some stuff for you know margin of successes for succeeding really well or just by a little or failing really horribly or just by a little and having some expanded crit options that kind of go along with that. But there's definitely some stuff in there that you can pick and choose from. Characters also have an energy pool, which is a little bit more on the BESM side because you don't really get that in D&D. But the energy pool lets you use your dynamic powers or some of your spell-like abilities. And then they have rules for if you run out of energy, how to recover energy, things like that. And then for characters that aren't necessarily going to be like your big spellcasters and stuff, they still have ways you can spin it to sort of represent luck or karma to, you know, affect die rolls or make little changes to the plot. So you can still make good use of the energy, even if you're not what you would think of as, you know, a caster-type character. It also talks about what to do if something changes how many points a player has and how to refund it. Like, for example, I was talking about, you know... If a character spends points to become a knight and then is stripped of the title, or if the player is given the title of a knight but then chooses not to spend the points on it, and yada yada yada. There's just a, a lot to, I guess, really think about. So it can make things a little bit more complex for the DM, but at the same time, there's a lot of other stuff where it feels like it gives you a little bit more freedom to make things. And then, of course, there's rules on creating encounters, NPCs, monsters, items, all that stuff you would expect. One of my favorites is this you know, section on starting adventure gear, because you know they say the players are going to start with whatever the DM finds appropriate, which could be you know, gold in a player's handbook, or they might have bonus points for their weapons and armor. But they have charts that give not only... You know, your normal player handbook stuff of cost, damage, damage type, all that stuff. But also the point costs. So you can go through and buy things with either points or gold, depending on how you want to do it. It also has, you know, some of your fun, more anime, you know, magic or advanced items. Like right here, we have what's basically the... ODM gear from Attack on Titan. You also have something that's basically a Pokeball and how to to stat it up, basically. In fact, it even goes through and gives us some, you know, example Neomorphs. You could probably make your own. But they give you stats and how to differentiate sort of between pets that someone might have and your battle Neomorphs that your pet trainers might be using. And they have some really cute ones in here. Uh, some, not so much. Like, I, I don't know what to do with this. this guy right here, like, what? What the heck? Speaking of, I know that they've reused, or it looks like they've reused some of the art from the BESM books. And then some of it, I'm fairly certain, is new. Because I am positive I would have remembered this monkey abomination if I had seen it before. 
I mean, I guess it's possible it could slip by me. But there's definitely some stuff in there that I think, oh, this is new. And I think it looks, you know, really in line with the rest of the stuff that I've seen from them art-wise. I will say I am slightly disappointed just because whenever I go to the very back and I look at the character sheet, I mean, it's a, kind of a traditional RPG character sheet. But I'm used to the BESM ones where it's, you know, color-coded on everything. It's bright. It's colorful. I really enjoy those. Um, but other than that, you know, a lot of this is going to be stuff that you're used to or have seen if you've played 5e or you're, you know, you've had a RPG book at any point in time. So it's going to, all the other stuff in there is going to be like, oh, this is advice for DMs on this type of game, that type of game, this type of player, so on. Yeah, basically at the end of this, I, I think a lot of it is they took the sort of character creation options from BSM and used that whole really customizable point by system and tried to match it up to the 5e crunch for like combat and skills and those types of rules. I think it'll be really interesting to see how this plays. I'm a big fan of the BESM style character creation and all that point stuff. I think a lot of people at this point are really comfortable with the, the way 5e handles combat and its various rules. I think this is a great transition. It's going to be, you know, either from one to the other. And I think it's also going to really help people maybe broaden out a little bit, but we'll still have something in there that maybe they feel familiar with, especially if they're coming from D&D. That's all I had for today. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you'd like to leave a like, comment, subscribe, that'd be great. If not, that's okay too. I understand. Either way, I hope you have an awesome day, and I will catch you next time.